Next keynote is being presented by Maria Berner. Maria Berner has a PhD in physics and an academic background in data analysis and processing. And Maria Berner is uh, talking about sustainability of AI, and she is um, uh, working or engaged in women in AI and robotics um, uh, at the moment a lot. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, also thank you very much for the invitation and um, tell you something about sustainability of AI because. Um, it's for me a very important topic because also the future of our generation is um, is quite delicate and I hope that uh, they will see as well um, a good world as we have it now. Um, so every time at home I always try to reduce my uh, the energy at home, so try to reduce the heat and also try to avoid having more um, uh, water and everything. So, But if it comes to work, we never think about um what is the carbon footprint of our work, if we are training in AI and whatsoever. However, this is quite important um, since what you can see here is that AI training of, for example, neural architecture search takes a lot of carbon emission. Yeah? It takes five times more than a US car in its whole lifetime. And this you can imagine is quite a lot. So we should always think about the carbon footprint as soon as we start an AI training and not simply just move all the data to any cloud and then just think, okay, and I now I have a good accuracy. This is not what we should uh, think of. Um, I mean, of course, this NAS um, training is a very extreme case of, of carbon footprint. Um, the normal cases are more in the below the air travel from New York to San Francisco. However, we still need to think how we can reduce the carbon footprint of AI training. Um, this is super important. I would like to show you how you can do it, which kind of factors lead to a high carbon footprint and how you actively can reduce the carbon footprint of your AI training. So first of all, you can um, go into the detail and tell you how you can uh, calculate the carbon footprint of the AI training. So first of all, the carbon footprint of AI training is given by um, a country factor, which I will just show you in a minute um, how this is working. It also depends on um, on the um, cloud facility itself, how efficient they are working, the training time of the AI training, as well as the power usage of the GPU and CPUs, as you can maybe imagine. So we will go through now um, all these factors and I will show you how much influences uh, these um, factors have on the carbon footprint. So first of all, the emission factors for different countries. So you can imagine that um, countries that um, using coal, for example, for energy production, they have a very bad um, emission factor, as you can see here in China, for example, but also Germany is not that good in comparison. If you go to uh, France, for example, they are using nuclear power for electricity as well. Uh, so they have a very low emission factor. And if you even go to Iceland, then it is very super low, yeah? So if you start your training in the cloud, always check where your cloud facility is located. Always choose a country um, with a low emission factor because this has a quite a big um, influence on your carbon footprint of the AI training. Another thing um, in, that influences the uh, carbon footprint of AI training is, of course, the power user efficiency of uh, the cloud facility itself. So um, this factor gives you the information how efficient a cloud facility is running. So um, how many um, electricity is used for light or cooling, um, but also how efficient the IT equipment is working. So in world average, we have here a factor of 1.67. And if you have a very high High efficient rate, you would have a factor around one. Um, the biggest cloud facility, they say they have a um, Pew factor of 1.1, 1.2. So um, if you choose one of the big cloud facilities, then I mean, you cannot change much. All of them, they have more or less the similar Pew factor. But still, if you choose a cloud facility, check the Pew factor and just check if this is really at a level of, of 1.1 or 1.2. Yeah, And um, also AWS gives you some information about the Pew factor. You can also run a carbon footprint calculator um, for, from them and you always check um, what your carbon footprint is. 
Another thing that influences the carbon footprint is, of course, the training time. You can imagine the longer the training time, the higher the carbon footprint of your AI training. Just to give you a little um, comparison, yeah? Cypher 10 here in ImageNet, there are two different um, data sets for image classification. Um, Cypher 10 has around 60,000 uh, data samples. ImageNet has around 14 million um, data samples. And in order to reach an accuracy of 50%, you would need for Cypher 10 48 seconds. In comparison with ImageNet, with the high amount of data samples, you need 11,000 um, seconds. So this means um, the training time goes di is directly um, proportional to the carbon footprint. So the longer you train, the higher your carbon footprint. Always try to reduce your training time in order to save CO2. It doesn't make sense to increase further your accuracy, even though by 1%, but then you're producing more um, carbon footprint or producing more CO2 um, because you have to run one week more or something. Yeah. So always think about what is uh, good if you really want to have higher accuracy or really want to uh, reduce uh, the CO2 emission. Something else that also um, goes into the influence for the carbon footprint is, of course, the power usage of the GPUs and CPUs. And here, um, as a little comparison, I show you Cypher 10 and uh, speech commands data set, and they use different uh, quite um, model architectures. The model architecture of Cypher 10 is more complicated and more complex than, for example, used for speech commands. And what you see here in this table is that um, the power usage that you use for Cypher 10 is much higher because of the more complex model architecture that you need in comparison to the speech command. So, as well here, always try not to make your um, model architecture too complex in order to save CO2. So um, maybe I hope you already got this information that depending on your use case, you produce a certain carbon footprint for your AI training. Um, the carbon footprint is really use case dependent, depends on so many factors, what I already had told you. And what you see here in this table is that, for example, for Cypher 10, you have a very low carbon footprint. However, what you see here as well is you can still reduce your carbon footprint if you're changing um, the training, AI training from China, for example, to Germany, and even further if you do it in France. Yeah, so even though it is quite small, you should still think about where you perform your AI training and reduce the carbon footprint by changing the location. But let's check on the um, a very high uh, carbon footprint of ImageNet, so this is also more or less an extreme case, but check how far you can go down with the carbon footprint if you change um, some of the settings around. So for example, if you train uh, the ImageNet in China with a very bad PU uh, factor, so the PU sh um, shows you how the cl cloud facility is running, um, then you have here a CO2 equivalent of 1,500 grams, which is quite a lot for running an AI training. If you already change your cloud facility within China to a cloud facility having a PU of 1.1, you already can reduce it to 1,000 grams, so already quite a bit. And then if you go to Germany, then you would can, uh, even reduce it to 700 grams, and in France, 85 um, grams. So this is quite a big um, reduction of the carbon footprint. So always keep in mind, you can reduce the carbon footprint of your AI training. Just choose the right location of the cloud facility where you perform your training. So, um, and here are some, some soft facts, more or less. I mean, most of you, them you already know. You should always try to choose your data wisely. I mean, as I have shown you in the, um, with the data set of ImageNet, it doesn't make sense to, to get as much data as possible, put all of these data in the cloud and then run your training because you will have a lot of training time, you will have a high carbon footprint, and you also may have buyers. So always check what kind of data you want to have for your training in order to get a high performance AI, but also in order um, to reduce the bias and also reduce the carbon footprint. And of course, always start st early stopping, for example, in order to reduce the carbon footprint and also to reduce um, overfitting, for example. What is very famous, of course, is also that you should use um, pre-trained AI models as, for example, hugging face. NAP models, they are producing, uh, they are big AI models having big lot of data. And if you would train them from scratch, 
you would, it would cost you a lot of money as well as um, a lot of time training them and a high carbon footprint as I have shown you in the first slide. So NAP problems are really big problems and they produce or require a lot of performance. So if you have these kind of issues, please always remember, try to find a pre-trained model that you can use and only fine tune because it will save money, it will save um, carbon, it will save also time for you. So, I mean, this is uh, just what I would like to show you and I hope for your next AI training you keep all these things in mind and I hope you perform it in a good way to save the world for the next generations because it is just the one world we have here and we need to take care of it and even on the AI training and also on our work. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to um, answer all your questions and I would be happy if you contact me or our network Women 9 Robotics. We are very active as well in the field of sustainability and also making women in uh, AI visible like today. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for this very insightful keynote. Do we have any questions from the audience? Do we have a question? I mean, also, would, if you try, run a training on, for example, edge devices, you also have a much more reduced carbon footprint just because you have like indirect training. A cloud facility always consumes a lot of um, energy, which is yeah, might be problematic. Also, solves many problems in uh, in many areas where the carbon footprint will be reduced exactly thanks to AI. So Yeah, yeah, that's also right. And thanks to using the cloud as well. Hi, thank you for the amazing presentation. I have a question. So what, in your opinion, is it the responsibility of the companies to reduce the uh, CO2 impact, or maybe also of the cloud providers by setting incentives. For example, uh, if a certain model is picked over another one, or if the training is aborted, like uh, prior finishing, um, to uh, yeah reduce the costs for for the company. What's your opinion on that? I think there are many people involved in this um, setting up AI training. Um, it is not only the responsibility of the cloud facility or the company. It is. I mean, it is as well the data scientists who are setting up um, more fancy, complex architectures want to have more data. And I think all of these people need to come together, working together in order to reduce the carbon footprint. So data scientists really need to try um, having a high performance AI, but not making it as more complex as it should be. And also finding the right data in order to train it. And of course, the cloud facility need to do their best to be more efficient, to have um, energy coming from sustainable sources, for example. I mean, they are doing already quite a lot and, and they go into the direction to do even more. But also in this sense, I mean, it doesn't make much sense of the cloud facility um, using sustainable energy, for example, but also they also depend on the country where they are. And if they need um, even more electricity, for example, um, if this electrici uh, electricity is coming from coal or some other um, non-sustainable energy resource, then it doesn't make much sense. So also the countries need to or play a very important role here that we really change uh, from coal to sustainable energies. Awesome, thank you. Thanks a lot. Maybe one more question linked to the previous question, like the economic incentives. So I mean, you were talking a lot about um, trade-offs between choosing which model, how detailed does it need to be, how much pre-configured models you use. So isn't it linked to economic incentives at some point too? Because if you have little value add and far more complex um, model using far more resources, both 
energy resources and like money if you um, buy computers. It's also linked to economic incentives, yes? Yes, yes, of course. I mean, the, the shorter the training time, the less you pay for in the cloud facility. Of course, it is also this incentive you have, yeah. yeah. And you see it directly in NLP. If you go to the Hugging Face page, they have a very good overview of how you can save money mm -hmm. as well as carbon footprint. They are also very active in this area. So you, your recommendation is to really think think a lot before you start, just start and to... Yeah. yeah. Do we have more questions? We have another question. Yes, um, again, thanks for the amazing presentation. Um, I just have one question uh, on regards to, uh, apart from the economic benefits that you have, uh, like, or money, monetary benefits, um, do you think, I mean, it's always so good to say, please take care, it's nice to have. Do you think there's a need for, um, maybe not right now, but a long-term uh, sort of a um, legal regulation that would help or support companies to actually, you know, um, to understand how to move in a in a right frame to uh, yeah save the energy in the long term, hmm. I'm I don't have a direct answer to you because uh, regulations can be good but uh, maybe also hinder further innovation. So I mean, if you imagine setting a, a limit for your carbon footprint, for example, then um, especially in NLP, you cannot have more innovation because it produces high um, carbon footprint. But as you said already, it can also lead to a lower carbon footprint if you already if you use these AI models on a later point for sustainable projects, for example. So um, this is a very I mean you always have to check, and I think a good way to go is that you have um, groups, um, ethical groups, and companies um, discuss what is really necessary, what you can do, um, how you move forward with innovation, but. Um, or how you can, I mean, reduce carbon footprint and yeah, and all these things. I think many people need to come together and what we have learned over the last two days is we need to communicate to each other. I think it's super important in this way, in this sense. Yeah, thanks a lot. So do we have another question? We have still have time for one or two questions. Uh, one sec, just... Do you think the big cloud providers are interested in uh, supporting uh, less computing time or isn't that their business model to and sell the computing time? I mean, in the sense of computing time, of course. I mean, but they also offer you, I mean, they offer also um, other ways to reduce, for example, the carbon footprint to, to just to make your running more efficient. So, but this is something you have to know your cloud facility and how is it working, what they offer. You need to be more or less an expert in this uh, field in order to make it efficient for you. In case of money and carbon footprint, of course. Um, I mean, what I have just checked up before was AWS is offering you things uh, in order to reduce the money, the cost for you, as well as the carbon footprint. But you have to check them up beforehand, yes. But I think um, due to the fact that more and more people going to a cloud, I think they are not that worried that the cloud is not used or that you're just using the half of the training time. I think they are still occupied with other projects as well. So do we have another question? So then maybe another question from my side or um, um, when you think about the future, what is what are your perspectives on next years? What's going to happen? Um, what do several stakeholders need to decide or to make to get more sustainable or to really um, use the potentials of digital technologies to get to sustainable development? Yeah, I think um, the German government can do a little bit more uh, in this sense. Um, yeah, also trying to, to avoid um, this energy that we are using at the moment. I think this is one big step we have to go, um, independ to be independent of other countries. I mean, we just see mm -hmm. that the way we are going in the case of energy is not the good one. Mm -hmm. So, um, and also support further innovation. What I have seen during work, my working time, working in the uh, startup scene, um, the startup scene is, is doing quite a lot. They're doing a lot of innovation, but this needs more support also from the government. Mm -hmm. And I think also here we need, I mean, startups and uh, entrepreneurs, they need more 
uh, support as well from the government here. Okay, so it's two things basically, um, innovation and uh, energy mix and the general dynamics of the overall economy to have like more, to lead to a more sustainable future. Yes. Thanks a lot Thank for you. this very inspiring words. Thank you.